Good evening and buenas noches. Welcome to all of you. My name is Edgardo Colón Emeric, and I am Dean of Duke Divinity School. And it is my pleasure to be with all of you today for this amazing event, a partnership of the Trinity Forum and Duke Divinity School. The Trinity Forum has as its motto, thinking, le connecting thinking leaders with leading thinkers. Duke Divinity School has as its motto, with some translation, uh, <laughs> connecting faith and learning. And the intersection of these two institutions is beautifully embodied by today's speaker, my friend, Kate Bowler. You know, we are living not just in imperfect days, but in very difficult days. As we think of anniversaries of the invasion of Ukraine and earthquakes in Turkey and Syria and personal challenges and tragedies that we may be carrying and bringing with us into this space. And there are a number of ways to respond to these. One way is carnival. <laughs> and today is Mardi Gras and the Feast of Fools, and venting and letting off steam by partying hard. And that has its place. There's another way, the way of blessing. And for tonight, uh, our speaker, uh, Kate Bowler, is an apostle of blessing. One of the things she loves to do in our community, Duke Divinity School, and that I'm so excited that she's going to be sharing with you, is simply blessing. And so thank you to all of you for showing up here. And I am very excited about our time of blessing today in perfect days, but there are blessings for these imperfect days. Welcome to all of you. Bienvenidos and bienvenidas. Well, thank you, Edgardo, for that lovely welcome. It's really a pleasure to get to work with you and with Duke Divinity on a collaboration that's lasted over eight years now. So thank you for that. And welcome to all of you joining us for tonight's sold out evening conversation with Kate Bowler on finding blessings in imperfect days. I wanted to acknowledge a few special guests who are with us tonight, including Kate's co-author on her most recent book, as well as the book Good Enough, and the co-producer of her podcast, Jessica Ritchie, who is here with us today, uh, as well as, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm tickled to have our board chairman, Richard Miles, and his wife, Phoebe Miles, and son, Christian, with us today, and also wanted to recognize Jennifer and Alan Peters of the McDonald Agape Foundation, whose generous support has helped make tonight's program possible. So thank you for that. We, yeah. <laughs> We also just appreciate the fact that each one of you are here and just want to especially welcome those of you who are here for the very first time. If you had friends who wanted to make it tonight but couldn't, we did sell out. We sadly had to cut off registration. Fear not, we will be recording tonight's evening conversation and posting it on our website, ttf.org, as well as our YouTube channel by close of day tomorrow. And we'll be posting photos on Facebook and the like, so be on the lookout for those as well. If you are one of those first time visitors or are otherwise new to the work of the Trinity Forum, part of our mission at the Forum is to provide a place for leaders to wrestle with the big questions of life in the context of faith and to host programs like our conversation tonight in order to cultivate, curate, and disseminate the best of Christian thought and invite reflection on those big questions to ultimately come to better know the author of the answers. And we hope tonight's conversation will be a small taste of that for you. So in an age of Photoshop filters, image management, personal branding, and curated media feeds, it can be very easy to feel like 
everyone around us is busy living their best life, going from strength to strength, smoothly sustaining professional advancement, self-actualization, Olympian workouts, happy families, <laughs> and deep friendships. And we alone are coping with heartache, loss, and pain. But all of us will experience heartbreak and suffering in our lives and be confronted with losses we cannot regain, hardships we did not choose and cannot shake. And no matter how we might yearn for certainties and coherence or strive for control, there remains a dark mystery in suffering and a limit to our understanding and agency. So how and where do we find hope and life amidst loss and pain? What does it mean to find blessing in imperfect days and the lives we actually have? These are obviously big questions and deep waters with no easy answers. But tonight we'll have the opportunity to hear from our guest who has grappled with such questions with remarkable honesty, faith, and love even in facing her own medical life sentence. Kate Bowler is a New York Times best-selling author, a historian, podcast host, top TED talker with more than six million views, and associate professor of the history of Christianity in North America at Duke Divinity School. Her scholarly works include Blessed, a history of the prosperity gospel, and The Preacher's Wife. But she's not only an accomplished scholar, she's also a woman with a remarkable story. At the age of 35, with a bright future and a baby son, she was unexpectedly diagnosed with stage four cancer and told that she had less than a year to live. An experience she has written about in two extraordinary memoirs entitled Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved and in No Cure for Being Human. Since then, she has created and launched, along with producer Jessica Ritchie, the podcast Everything Happens, where she talks with a variety of guests about the wisdom distilled from their own experiences, and co-written with Jessica her latest work and the new release, The Lives We Actually Have, A Hundred Blessings for Imperfect Days, which we've invited her here today, tonight to discuss. So after Kate o offers opening remarks, she and I will get to have a conversation, followed by an opportunity for questions from all of you in the audience. Kate, welcome. <laughs> oh my gosh, I should be so lucky to have two preachers before me. That was stunning. Uh, this is a really special community. I mean, look at all your gorgeous moon faces. I mean, come on. This is a, um, a perfect place to be imperfect. And I feel, I feel so grateful. It's, uh, it's a weird time for us to feel like we are attempting to remake ourselves. I think especially, not just in the last few years, but even in the last few months, we constantly feel the fits and starts of the momentum of our life. We feel the sort of, we can look down on what was once a poured slab foundation and see all the little fissures there. And we may have a, more of a sense of the intense fragility of our lives than we find useful. <laughs> <laughs> because here we are. We are people who are changed somehow. And I think that's one of the very difficult to describe truths about survival, about how we are different than we were before, how we want to reach for a kind of hope that things don't even always have to be as they've been. We want to believe that change is possible. We could be kinder, perhaps, than we've ever been, more empathetic than we were raised to be, more aware of policies that bring justice to our neighbors, and while we're on the subject of neighbors, less pissy about our actual neighbors. <laughs> Martha. Um, <laughs> someday Martha will see my attempts to love her, and just you. And 
I think we have the sense consistently that we want not just to simply pass the years, but to outgrow our worst selves. That each passing year might bring not just change, but transformation. And I think that is, uh, frankly, the language that we are particularly good at is, because uh, we just finished uh, February, so we are about 100 days into not achieving our New Year's resolutions. <laughs> uh, so now is almost like the perfect time to set aside our grand religion of New Year's, of New Year, New You. Surprise, rinse, repeat. New Year, New You. Surprise, <laughs> rinse, repeat. New Year. But I think by now, uh, we might feel a little frustrated that we ought to have been different, given all we've learned and how far we've come. We may feel, as the ancient Roman philosopher Seneca said, that this space that has been granted to us rushes by so speedily and so swiftly that all save a very few find life at the end just as we are getting ready to live. And I think we would be lying if we didn't say that trying feels a little bit harder than it did before. And that must be especially difficult for Americans to admit, she said respectfully as a Canadian, who wanted so much to bring it up earlier in the conversation but has politely waited till now. But Americans are famous for trying to try. And I love too being in an America room and have these, and thank you for putting the Canadian flag so near the door. I was. Uh, I loved, Edgardo, what you said about our plausible responses. The, um, the desire for escape, and sometimes that can include joy. But then the other, which is the white-knuckling response, in which we double down on an account of our own sanctification. We are wearied, who then weary. And, uh, and that's just what I wanted to say for one um, moment, because I have you captive for one moment. Uh, but that, it's a very popular American response to imagine then in our weariness that every act of God or pandemic or tragedy is here to teach us a really important lesson about trying. And if that does not feel familiar anymore, I would just go with me in your mind to the beginning of the pandemic when the American middle class seemed to experience just a surge of collective resolve, we weren't trapped at home in a remaking Earth plague. We were cutting down on our commute time. We were spending more quality time with loved ones. We were picking up old hobbies. Uh, there were just silver linings everywhere. I heard about sourdough starters <laughs> from people I once respected. I learned about the shocking benefits of uh, applying for suburban chicken coop licenses. <laughs> Carpe diem, we got a Peloton, you know? <laughs> it, there were just bucket list items there to check off right at home. Uh, just think about the beach body we made from the free weights we found in the garage. <laughs> Count your blessings, be more present. Hadn't you always wanted to spend more time with your family? <laughs> I started a French immersion during the pandemic, by the way. I made the mistake of signing my son up for the French immersion school of my youth. And he got half an hour of online learning. So all I heard was like, bonjour, 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 bonjour. And then like 50 people trying to auto shut off children's microphones. But Sri, you couldn't have said a more uh, perfect inventory of the feeling we have then right now if we check our social media feed. Uh, because you already know, and if you haven't, people uh, mailed them to you at Christmas. They, it's just, uh, every family uh, has a scholarship winner, and, and we are really happy for them. Um, other people, if you don't know, are already living beautiful, perfect, effortlessly joyful lives. And it's pretty embarrassing uh, that you in particular, uh, I can't look at you though, because you look so nice, but like, <laughs> I want to be like, but you in particular have not uh, joined their ranks already. I made a very simple list. We were supposed to, ready, use this moisturizer, lose any extra pounds. Did you really give 10% of your income to charity this year? Your grandma needs a card. I'm not sure you've forgiven your father. Wait, what about that credit card debt? Did you finish your degree? Also, your partner thinks you're selfish. But I think the key thing is, 
that, uh, and I think we can all feel it at this very moment, but there is a 99% chance that your photos were not synced with the cloud. <laughs> and I don't know where it is, but uh, you are at risk of losing them forever. And then, you know, there are all the real things. We are sick. We are tired. Our friends' problems are eating us alive. Our kids are not well. Our parents are in pain. Someone we love is losing their memory or in a difficult situation, and they are just miserable to care for. And we live under the weight of the person we expected we would be this exhausting perfectibility paradigm that tells us that we should try harder, do better. So I just have one suggestion, and that's it. I would very much like us all to give up on living our best lives now. And if I could just tell you what a wonderful, wild, and awful experience it would be for you at your next social gathering to declare it to another, preferably a stranger, I would love for you to use the words when they say, how are you? You say, I'm no longer living my best life now. <laughs> it's televangelist Joel Osteen, this poor man that I wrote a whole history book just so that he could coin this phrase in 2004. But what happened is almost overnight, the phrase best life now went from nothing. And you can just Google Ngram this sucker if you like, to being the perfect encapsulation of an entire series of multi-billion dollar promises of the health and wellness industry, all of our secular prosperity gospels, that we could be perfect, we should be perfect. And then every Hallmark movie starlet and Oprah and cousin who has recently discovered essential oils <laughs> just looked directly into their own hearts and said, uh, yeah, I should probably do that. And then we saw it on everyone's Facebook or, God forbid, TikTok account. And it looked something like um, surfing in New Zealand again. Does it ever get old? <laughs> or um, the ultimate relationship prosperity gospel. Happy anniversary, honey. You're my best friend, my soulmate, my everything. Hashtag blessed. One time, though, I did. I was, I've never seen, I had never seen yachts before. And I was perusing the docks. And these are my walking hands. Actually, I did need to stabilize. Uh, and I did see a yacht that genuinely said, too blessed to be stressed. And you just see me on a dock, just <laughs> so happy, so happy for him. But I think the collective weight of this message is now something we see uh, not only in uh, megachurches to Burning Man. This is obviously a Burning Man crowd, so <laughs> I feel I need to bring that in now to Goop, to uh, your local hot yoga studio where like one woman really, really, really wants to explain manifesting to you. Uh, it's also an entire section in Target. It's always right beside whatever Joanna Gaines has just made. And we are very happy for her, but the section beside it is the good vibes only section in which we are being reminded that we can organize ourselves, heal ourselves, budget ourselves, love ourselves, eat ourselves whole, and anything less is low self-esteem. And it has become the dominant mode of how we think about what we are capable of inside a day, a week, a month, a life. We are living inside modernity's fever dream that asks us, can we conquer this project called the self? And if you don't believe me, but you do, of course, because we are friends, but if you didn't, uh, just look at the weekly New York Times list. And if you were like me and you made weird spreadsheets, which I do, uh, but if you go back to when it, the, in 1984, the New York Times was so disheartened by the juggernaut, which is this genre of perfectibility, that it just gave up and it made its own list. And that list is called self-help slash advice slash think recipes slash miscellaneous. <laughs> and that's because if it hadn't, no other work of nonfiction would have had a fighting chance. That is how dominant this mode of cheap paperback religion. 
that we have ingested, which has now become fully orbed commercial enterprises. Someone always has a, a social scientist or one psychologist who's willing to back it with a psychological stamp of expertise. And because I'm a sadist, I made a list of everyone's reading habits during the pandemic because I thought, surely, surely now, when we are facing uh, an exhausting earth plague, would be the time to challenge this dominant cultural narrative. But what it did, and I think, so you know the answer to what happened. <laughs> I don't, I'm skipping the part where I tell you that it got worse because what it has done to all of us. And so I spent all of my 20s, uh, for some chosen reason, interviewing televangelists. And I feel like you could tell that about me. Uh, so, but it was my great, it was my great privilege and joy to take very seriously people who are attempting a theological framework around the feeling of being happy, wealthy, whole, that God looks at us and just says yes. Because don't we just want God to say yes sometimes? But we have this caricature of the televangelist and uh, televangelism. And now if you look at the diffusion of this impulse into our social media habits, what we can see, like we're just all running 24-hour programming now. What it's done to all of us is made us all into televangelists of good, better, best. So, my darlings, that is just why um, it's been five years of attempting to have conversations where we thread the needle on uh, never forcing anyone to say, I would never go back, or these are the lessons I learned, but the truth is there is this crystalline quality to the beauty of what we learn because we have been somehow refined by something awful. And in that, there's a little glittering gem. And that's why uh, Jessica and I, who is my co-author and co-conspirator and great joy of my life, um, we started writing blessings at the end because we thought, how do we take the thing and we uh, desperately attempt to resist cliches, which we all love, myself included, um, and we try to say something spiritually true, which frankly is always more difficult <laughs> than I expect. <laughs> and so this language of blessing became a way to return to the beginning, which was that I had been steeped in a hashtag blessed world, and I had lost the ability to say, what then can we say? about a God who desperately desires to be there in the particularity, loves to surprise us with love and somehow a transcendent surprise. And so um, we thought, uh, yeah, I think we're ready for blessing in the midst of this. And uh, I asked my friend, he is a wonderful Old Testament uh, colleague at Duke Divinity School, Stephen Chapman, because he's writing a book on blessing, and I'm obviously a Hebrew scholar. So I was like, send me everything, Stephen. And, um, he had this lovely phrase where he called blessing a form of emplacement, like a this goes here, that goes there feeling. It reminds me of sort of spiritual uh, interior design where you reorder all of the furniture of where you imagine things should go because in the midst of an undoing, we never really get the lives we hoped for, right? There's, and that's what we just said it over and over again. It's just the lives we actually have. So how do we then say, in the midst of this, God, in the terrible and the beautiful, in the lovely and the awful, let's, let's just bless it all. So my darlings, we're going to talk, and it's going to be great, because Cherie is a delight. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks, Kate. It's always fun to talk with you. <laughs> but, um, well, so many questions. Uh, we'll just start with the fact that, um, you know, in reading through not just your most recent yeah. book, but, um, but some of the others as well, struck by a certain symmetry in oh, that yes. um, <laughs> you, know, you start off, started off with blessed, yeah. you know, the history of the prosperity movement. Um, you literally wrote the definitive scholarly work uh, on the history of the prosperity movement. And uh, your most recent book gives us 100 blessings for imperfect days. 
And one of the things that I was struck by is that you've said in some of, some of your memoirs that you found through your own experience of suffering that while you, you consciously rejected the, the tenets of the prosperity movement, yeah. the, God, the idea that God wants us uh, yeah. to be healthy, wealthy, wise, popular, and everything else. I like popular. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you nevertheless uh, found that you'd internalized yes. some of those uh, teachings. And so I, I'd love to hear you sort of talk about how your view of what blessing mm -hmm. is and what it means to be blessed mm -hmm. has changed from, from yeah. blessed to a yes. hundred blessings. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> from hashtag blessed to blessed is a... Uh... Well, I, I had... Um, both my parents were academics. So there was... I grew up in the... University of Manitoba, and I hope everyone from University of Manitoba hears me when I say, I love that university, but they really test manures in the fall. Every <laughs> fall, it's a historically agricultural school. I did not grow up with a sense that academia was a terribly fancy place. Mm -hmm. It was the place where lovely acts of great learning happen, but also they test manures in the fall. <laughs> and what I learned from my parents was that there can be good work, but it was always going to be um, a lot of exhausting scrappiness mm -hmm. because yeah. it is a, because every act is hard. And so I just started climbing a ladder without assuming that I was the kind of person who climbs ladders. And I just didn't stop. I, in part because I kept having setbacks that kept pushing me all the way down. I was like the wrong way on a moving um, sidewalk over and over again. I. Tried to finish my dissertation. I had a health um, disaster where I lost use of my arms for two years. So I had to do most of uh, blessed with voice dictation, which honestly, if I'm tired, you can still hear the way I go, Sheree, comma. <laughs> just like, but then, and then it was years of infertility. And then, uh, but everything was both amazing. I got my dream job, I married my high school sweetheart, but it, mm -hmm. everything was work always. And so by the time I was leveled with a stage four cancer diagnosis, I had fully internalized that I am running an obstacle course and all of this depends on me. And I never would have thought that spiritually I'm the kind of person who thought, God, I've really earned this, until I was so outraged that my life would end that fast after I just cleared the hurdle, I was like, okay. <laughs> I feel like maybe I'm going to introduce more spiritual language for deserve right now. <laughs> so, um, and so I found myself hoping for all of the same prosperity gospel dreams that I had been trying to compassionately but carefully document for such a long time. And it really cured me of a kind of, any kind of, frankly, like snobbery mm -hmm. about uh, prayers, desperation for miracles, the intensity of hope. Like, oh, I just wanted, yeah. I wanted promises and guarantees, God. So that sort of like pulled a thread and then like you're wearing a sweater and then you're not wearing a sweater anymore, sort of <laughs> theologically. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's taken me a bit to kind of come back to the language because I felt so strange about it. I felt like I could only say it gently ironically. <laughs> Uh, and then I needed to say, um, because at the end of the podcast, it's the first time I've had a community like that that I get to be actively responsible for. And I thought, no, like we need more than here's the here's here's Kate's didactic <laughs> moment at the end. Like, how do we ask God to? And I think this is the nature of blessing: is it's similar to joy, which is we can't manufacture it. It is surprise and it is transcendent hope. And when we just get it in our lap, we think, man, thank you. You wouldn't have been here. Mm -hmm. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, another, um, another theme that seems to come out from your various works um, that I noticed was, was truth-telling. Yeah. And reflected in the titles of each of your <laughs> sure. books. Sure. Oh, well, that's a weird tree. I don't like that. You're feeling, yes, you're right. I never noticed that. That's you know, awful. Just everything happens for a reason. Other lies I love. Oh. No cure for being human. Other truths I need to hear. Yeah. The lives we actually have. No, you're right. You know, they, they, <laughs> this is... <laughs> That's terrible. No, no. I did not notice that. <laughs> 
So just in skimming through them, I was like, there, there's kind of like an implied, possibly unwelcome truth bomb that's about to, yes. about to drop from. And, and so I wondered um, kind of what you were thinking, yeah. the lies that we internalize and sure. believe, the lies that we try to force on those who are suffering. Yes. Um, yeah. it, it seems like there's, there's something coming out there. We'd love to hear your oh my thoughts gosh. on that. <laughs> Jessica, pass me my diary. I, uh, <laughs> I, the the truth is, almost right away, I I began, I began to lie to everybody. Mm-hmm. I was so scared that I would be the kind of person not worth all the attention it takes to care somebody else's life, because it's not cute. Like the, hey, guess what? I might medically bankrupt everyone I love. It got intense so quickly that I really did. Um, it really did That's lose the ability to stick you. I feel like you also knew that. So. <laughs> She's a prophet, or she's very good at her job. Um, uh, most of the difficult things in my life, I've wanted to keep to myself. Yeah. And then I felt the weight of the cultural scripts that reward, especially in women, to exhausting cheerfulness. <laughs> I'm supposed to be resilient <laughs> at all times. Um, but it was, uh, and the, and that even for every small thing in the midst of a tragedy that I was supposed to be grateful. Aren't you so glad you kept your hair? I mean, you get to these moments where you're like, You do have great hair. <laughs> <laughs> you always actually really have you. <laughs> but in every other moment, you're like, I don't think that's the word, the word grateful is for. You know? So I, I didn't know how to... And it wasn't just that I, you, know, you can't tell a stranger even though you're ruining every kid's birthday party with your answer to, who are you? <laughs> Not well, Linda. <laughs> Not well. <laughs> but um, but I, I lied mostly to, to the people who love me best because the truth was unbearable. So I think I, st- I started writing because I, was, I needed to, uh, to say something even if, I couldn't, uh, even if I couldn't say it to the people I love. Yeah, you've talked in your book, in the introduction, as well as the other books, about the, the pressure to always yeah. have a lesson. Yes. And, you know, frankly, <laughs> I felt that internally, even just in preparing for this, you know, wanting to sure. extract, yeah. extract the lessons. Um, That's so natural, though, because it's yeah. wisdom, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's we, a quarter turn away right. from the are, garbage version. Yeah, and we, and we yeah. are meaning-making creatures. Yes. Um, and, yes. you know, I was just struck by... Um, well, you, you said in your um, introduction, I'm going to quote you, you are loath to say, I learned lessons. Yes. You know, I hate how suffering people are forced to say this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you also said that you, you have learned a great deal oh. about your faith in particular, and you put it this way, about the beauty and character about a God who walks with us to the yeah. edge. And, and so I would love to hear your thoughts on kind of both what you've learned through um, mm-hmm. this incredible journey. And then also what you would say to someone who is in the midst of their own suffering and yeah. feels like they don't have Ooh. the consolation yes. of some distilled lessons yes. to take from the experience. Right. And like we are always lucky if we survive long enough to get lessons. Yeah. Mostly right. we're just trying to, you know, it's Wednesday and we're doing something awful. And, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else is doing mm-hmm. it awful with us and then we are and we endure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think maybe the first lesson I was um, was just a surprise. I felt uh, I felt so bizarrely deeply loved in the days and weeks right after my diagnosis that felt. Um, entirely up against the deep horror and anger I felt. But I felt, in the most embarrassing way, deeply, deeply loved by God while I was actively so angry. And uh, that felt like it stripped from me the feeling like I needed to be good anymore. I, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I took up swearing that Lent. Like, I wasn't <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. pious, I think is the word we're reaching for. Um, mm-hmm. But I felt so loved that it did transform my understanding of whether what my effort is for. So I, I, I guess after that, I started thinking a lot about what we expect from God. And that sort of has been in my attempt to really try to 
learn from other people in my own experience. Like, what can we then say about the God of being with, about the indispensability of interdependence, um, the cruelty of the way our culture talks to and about the suffering? I mean, medical bankruptcy should not be the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country. It is, it is wild, it is wild to me what we do to the suffering. Yeah. So, but I think in that, what I, so I, I'm like, in the lessons language, I'm kind of intense about like, so what then can we say? <laughs> and I, I do, um, I do believe that God draws near to the suffering. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think that is God's great A game. Mm -hmm. Not saying that he absolutely loves them more, but he definitely loves them more. <laughs> 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 or at least he makes us feel that way every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it was fascinating how you described what you just sort of alluded to that um, you know, in the days and weeks immediately afterwards yeah. when it was a crisis, yeah. before it became chronic, um, you felt the presence of God so palpably. Yeah. Uh, and you, you talked about something else that happened um, that came with almost the realization, or the deep realization of yeah. a frailty and finitude. And you talked about how the world around you and the people um, in it, you saw not only with clarity, yeah. but with, um, yeah. with sparkle, yeah. I think is the word that you used. Yeah. Um, is there something about frailty and finitude yeah. that clarifies or even bedazzles you know, <laughs> our, our, our world? It's <laughs> true. I mean, it's um, the way, uh, like if you, like when you, if you ever get to make a human with your body and you know, and mm -hmm. you look at them, or when a friend looks at you and just can't, and sees everything and loves the absurdity of you, mm -hmm. like it, you've, it, love is in every terrible and beautiful detail. So when, I, think when you, I think when we feel our own stories, yeah. like our beginning, middles, and ends, um, the totality of it starts to feel so extra beautiful and awful. Mm -hmm. Because the never enoughness, I guess like a thought, um, so poor Duke Divinity School, I wander around there having a lot of spiritual feelings. And <laughs> we have this really sweet professor named Warren, and like he should not be the person. I'm like, Warren, I worry I don't have good enough self esteem. <laughs> you know, but like he's a scholar of early church fathers, and that's not his specialty. <laughs> we don't have psychologists on staff for these problems. But um, I was like, Warren, do you think that because I'm hung all out? When I look at the world, then it feels so beautiful, but it, it, I feel like I will starve to death. You know, and mm -hmm. I think that, I, but I think that's what love is, that mm -hmm. they'll never be enough. And he gave me a great book on the uh, appetites in the early church fathers. <laughs> and I think we both agreed I might not be wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure we agreed I was entirely right. But uh, every beautiful thing, I think to me that's the feeling. Uh, I, I always worry that. I should have the sense that so much beauty creates completeness. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think I've ever felt that way. It's, and I think that's the way God loves us, is just more and more and then more. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you had mentioned when you, um, well, after you got your diagnosis, uh, that you were essentially looking for, um, for strength and sustenance. Yeah. Um, and quickly realized, I think, um, maybe quoting or at least uh, paraphrasing you, that, that thankfulness would not get you to wholeness. <laughs> that there were, and, yes. and you know, we're, we're so often, especially when things are um, at least you know, mildly rough, you know, yeah. kind of you know, told to counter blessings. Um, yes. you know, and, and gratitude, of course, is a virtue. Yes. Um, you know, we are not just called, but commanded you know, to be grateful in all things. Um, but would be curious like what you found the limits of gratitude to yes. be. <laughs> yes, because so often it's applied to people in the midst of their terrible things yes. as an incredible solution to the problem of suffering. Um, mm -hmm. It's usually a different way of just saying, uh, you should, shouldn't you be grateful for is very similar to the words, at least you, uh, which and <laughs> any uh, relativizing is so, it's so painful when you're, um, when you're just, when, when even the lovely things are, I mean, it, all the be I mean, frankly, all the best things are also burdens, right? The way we love each other, anvils. The way that we care about each other, stuck in one place, forever loving them, caring about their problems. I mean, it's, it's horrific what love does. 
So, I mean, even when we're asked to name all the good things, I think this is why I find the gratitude framework to be very, very limiting. Because it's not just the, it's not just the vices or the suffering that we're trying to endure. It's just, it's mostly how much we love and belong to each other that breaks our hearts open. So, I, I did find that, like, I, I did honestly have a big whiteboard where I would add up um, lovely small things, but I, was, I tried not to make a gratitude list. Uh, but it was a gratitude list. I just needed to say uh, that blood work nurse was really nice. Or um, the, the lobby doesn't smell like grilled cheese anymore. <laughs> but it, it helped me, and I think this is when we say, God bless this day. It's a similar act when we say, God help me notice the things I would not have noticed. And it's an, it's an imperative. God bless this day. You said you'd be here, so bless it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned um, the response, at least you. Um, <laughs> and you know, I think one thing that so many of us have kind of grappled with is wanting to be um, yeah. a help, a blessing, a comfort yeah. um, to people who are suffering more than us. And being afraid we're going to, you know, st stick our foot in it or, or whatever. Um, I would would love to hear your thoughts on how one yeah. is a blessing to the suffering. Oh, that's nice, Cherie. What a thoughtful question. Because I think people have different sort of personalities of blessing. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. you're the first responder person who yeah. runs in and has a very loud voice. <laughs> Honestly, we do need that yes. person. Yes. <laughs> that person uh -huh. will get you the pillow mm -hmm. that no one is getting you. Um, it's maybe you're the food bringer, and then your blessing is that of, oh, I really like this. My grandma used to make it. Maybe you're a great planner, and next Wednesday, you actually will carve out time to pick something up and drop it off. Mm -hmm. I think our, our, the inventory of the thing that feels effortless to us is usually the better place, I think, to lean into to that act of moreness. Mm -hmm. Because almost everybody will, one, we will all say the wrong thing. Yeah. It, it's, I say the wrong thing constantly, even though I wrote a whole appendix to hand out to family and friends <laughs> in an act of just mm -hmm. uh, wild hubris. Because. Um, <laughs> I think because the, the trick is we're, we're trying to learn to keep pace with each other's hopes, right? right? You don't want to get too far ahead that you're like, everything's going to be, and you don't want to get too far behind that you can't lean into uncertainty with mm -hmm. them. And I think blessing lets us kind of like key into the gift of intense presence yeah. without saying presence fixes it. Right. Presence just says, in this moment, how can I... How can I just like match your pace? Yeah. You know, earlier when you were speaking, you mentioned um, you know, the language of agency. That yes. We, all... we don't believe in it, do we? <laughs> I mean, entirely. Go ahead, Sherry. Sorry. No. You know, we all love to think that we have agency, and not only agency, yes. but you know, also perfectibility, as yeah. you were talking about. You know, you, you you have a bunch of books about limits and finitude. You know, and I feel like it's not a very DC book. <laughs> you, know you know what I mean? Well, it's, you know, it's it's not a like. A... Well, you know, in many ways, it's very, it's very <laughs> gutsy. You know, in that um, you you have books on on finitude and limit and constraint at a time when... I'm always like, I hope you I, like this medium sad book. <laughs> I, and if your life is going well, I'm actually happy for you. you know, um, it, it, frankly, yeah. at a time when, you know, an unlimited life is yes. all the rage. I mean, I think... Oh, my gosh. You know, there's yes. a car called the Infinity. No yes. Limits is an advertising slogan, a, a sportswear yes. company, a documentary. This um, book was right next to... Um, uh, unlimited, a book called something like Unlimited You, and I was like, oh boy, I feel like I'm part of the Limited You series. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so one of the things I would love to kind of hear you kind of expand upon is, um, you know, when we, when we put too much faith in agency, yeah. um, how does that yeah. affect our, not only our capacity to bless, yeah. but our, our capacity to receive blessing? Right. Right. And, and I mean, theologically, too, it's so complicated based on which tradition that mm -hmm. we fall into. We have uh, Christian traditions based on 
you know, uh, lie down. God is doing all the work. Just enjoy the fact that you're going to be saved and it's going to happen. Enjoy the ride. Um, and we have uh, ones of sort of hyper sanctification. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there is language of Christian perfectibility that runs through many strains, especially Pentecostalism. Mm -hmm. So some, sometimes based on how we're, what our framework is, we have a different story about how much God wants us to do. And which I will settle here tonight. The answer is, just joking, <laughs> just joking. Um, but an, a, like a healthy account of limited agency in which we have more language for our own, um, you know, yes, in, in Christ we can all do, do all things, um, but, uh, but not always today. <laughs> it allows us to recapture, I think, a humility that is always embarrassing. We don't really want help. Why would we? It's, it's awful and it's usually inconvenient but people will need to save us, and will, we will need the God who encourages them to do so. So our account of limited agency is the reason why we have the church, is because we will need all members, all people, all kinds, all ages, all types, people we don't like, people we do. And I think it also encourages us um, to choose a God who's already chosen us. So weirdly in the both, we'll find our um, limited agency is always going to be my favorite category for let's, let's bless whatever, let's bless whatever is happening today. One of the other things I, I loved about uh, your works is that um, it, it points to the beauty of our creatureliness, you know, um, our, our embodiment, our, our humanity, mm -hmm. um, the way that God created us. I, I think about, um, I think Wendell Berry once talked about how he could see the division of the future basically being divided into people who wanted to be creatures versus people who wanted to be machines. Oh, that's lovely, yeah. And, um, you know, and, and just the contrast yeah. to you know, all the constraint and frailty that comes with being embodied. Yeah. You know, we see kind of a, a movement afoot of you know, tech bros who basically want to download their minds, um, who, who uh, you know, a, a turn towards being a machine, whether it's just being in terms of unlimited productivity. I met someone who has a staff who <laughs> monitors his biorhythms. And I uh, uh, yes. would just like to say that we did not have similar worldviews. <laughs> <laughs> but he seemed really nice. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I would love to hear kind of what you make of this, yeah. both um, you know, as someone who is a professor of Christianity at Duke Divinity School, but yes. also someone who, yes. has, um, who has suffered the constraints and pains of embodiment as a well. Hey, it's just so the, weird, right? It's like yeah. the, that our finitude now is the enemy, mm -hmm. that death is an embarrassment to mm -hmm. us. I mean, yeah. our... I noticed this, so I study self-help books, and I really noticed that too with the, like I've been reading all, like I've been reading hundreds and hundreds of them by myself, so just <laughs> pardon the in intensity you'll see in my eyes in a moment. Um, but uh, especially the books about the last quarter of life, I think what they keep describing is sort of um, an empowered second middle age, mm -hmm. as if you'll find new things to be ambitious about. And I think what, what it's struggling to do is to feel, is to, I mean, because we'll never say it. We'll never say, I've lost things I can't get back. We'll never say, I can't go back to before. It's always, it's always younger you, better you. I, I read one the other day, you can become chronologically older, but cellularly younger. <laughs> and I was like, you're doing a lot in your basement, sir. <laughs> I am not doing in mine, uh, but I, I think we, I think we are, especially in our story of reinvention, we we have over oxygenated the atmosphere to a point where we can now. It's just, it's it's this, but it's this top of Everest. Mm -hmm. We will see endings. We will, need we will need people to reflect back to us a story we can no longer tell. Yeah. I don't know if we're culturally ready for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're going to turn to questions from all of you in the audience in just a moment. But before we do, um, 
Edgardo mentioned Carnival. Uh, tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, which I guess is sort of a national holiday for frailty and finitude um, in some it. ways. <laughs> <laughs> I know, the bummer season has begun, and I'm very excited. Yeah. And, um, you know, given that you have a couple of books now on, on blessings yeah. and uh, for different occasions, would love to hear about how your own experience has yeah. made you think about uh, the practice of focusing yeah. um, on our own frailty, not just physical, yeah. but also spiritual, our yeah. sin uh, and our mortality and the reminders that Lent brings. Yes, because I do think mm -hmm. it's it's a relief. Like, mm -hmm. I did initially think, oh no, I'm suffering and now I have to take on the practice of suffering. <laughs> this seems like a lot of work. Um, <laughs> but I think what's mm -hmm. such a relief for all those of us who are tired is that it it's Lent doesn't just ask us to necessarily always pick something up, but we can set something down mm -hmm. in the knowledge that we are following God on the downslope. And we are learning how, I mean, just with this cryogenically whatnot business, <laughs> we're going to Walt Disney all of our futures, um, mm -hmm. is that we're learning to tell a story in which uh, Jesus' own suffering is not an embarrassment. Jesus' tears and bleeding mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and betrayal and loneliness aren't then an affront to our, our, our perfect God. Right. I think feeling an intense solidarity with the, the God who knows intimately our finitude is, I mean, I think Lent is a great time if, mm -hmm. if people are just having an awful time to just mm -hmm. feel the church learn to speak our language. Mm -hmm. And then if we are on the upswing a little, if it is our time for in which we can um, take on those lovely additional practices. I, I do think we are, we are rehearsing the story of our ends. And I, I think with all hard things, we need practice. So we learn in Jesus' death our own, and then and we, we learn in resurrection the long end of a big story. But we're gonna, we need a lot of reminders. So we got 40 days. We got a whole, <laughs> it keeps happening, yeah. All right, we'll come to this, which is often the most dynamic part of our evening conversations, and that is you're hearing from, from you all and your questions. And those of you who have been to a Trinity Forum event before know that we have a few requests to accompany any of your questions. One, we ask that your question be brief and succinct, uh, that your question be civil, and that all questions be in the form of a question. <laughs> and so we have a few mics that will be roving. Uh, just wait till you are recognized, and if you could stand and uh, say your name and then your question, that'd be great. Mary, we'll start with you on the very front row I'd here. I'd like that you know that it's Mary. Hi, Mary. <laughs> Come here often? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You. Okay, oh, you're going to hold it yeah. so you don't trust me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're right not to. Okay, I have like 100 questions. I'm only going to ask two. You can, at, you can answer any one you want. I want to know what role community played for you as you journeyed through sort of the very darkest days of suffering um, and how community yeah. helped transform you. And then the other one, I'm reading Sarah Coakley's book right now on spiritual healing. Yeah. And... How would, how would you define healing or make meaning of healing this side of things? Yeah. So, thanks. Right. Two massive and great questions, comma, Mary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the first on community is, uh, and this like happened in different stages. I have found, especially around a crisis, it is a lot easier to galvanize community. With a chronic life, it is harder to maintain the same friends you did before. I have almost none of the same people in my life that I did initially. I think it just went on for too long. Yeah. Um, what that taught me, though, is the um, in is that we can never, even if we want to, be the heroes of our own story. There's kind of no such thing as heroic suffering, when in the end, everything uh, that needs to be done will be done for us. So I, had a, um, I was so far away from my family, and I didn't have, I mean, I just, I had my school. And I was like, well, guys, we were colleagues. <laughs> I guess someone's taking me to the hospital this week. <laughs> uh, but uh, it taught me so much about the church 
because uh, they have all these bonus features, uh, clerical collars, um, anointing oils in like every gym bag. I guarantee you this man has both a clerical collar and anointing oils somewhere in that bag. And that's a true fact. They just pop it on in terms of um, so may I interest you in working at a divinity school. Um, but it taught me so much about the humility required to be loved. Like I, I would wake up sometimes and I'd be wearing socks I didn't put on, which is weird. Uh, but Thea in Old Testament had knitted them for me. And I still find that like one of the most beautiful. <laughs> so that's fine. Anyway, I'm for it. Um, ugh, horrible. Um, uh, healing is a long story, isn't it? I, I studied faith healing for such a long time. So I've been to like hundreds of miracle rallies. And uh, so I, and, uh, I do believe that instantaneous and miraculous and lovely things can happen. But so often a story of healing is, is mostly the story about God saving the world and that it might not be in my time or my body. Or, and I, it is so hard to sit with both, especially when you don't see someone experience the fullness that they frankly deserve. So yeah. it's always lament and it's always hope, but they're, you know, weird pinchy hands was where that ended. There. Anyway, thank you for your question. Other questions right here in the middle. If you could stand up, that'd be great. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> hi, Kate. Hey. Um, I work with little kids. Um, and... Yeah. I know, sorry. You're doing great. Oh. Yeah. They are struggling right now. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious because I know you have a son. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. how do we support our young ones? And I'm like snorting up here now. So no, that's really yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. But um, not that you have an answer, but like, yeah. what are the messages? Like, what are we grappling with right now? Like, what yeah. can we be passing on to them to like yes. hold space for what they've been through? Yeah while grappling with what we've been through. Yeah, all oh, hun. And it's all on the surface, I imagine, where they really tell you. Oh, yeah. They really tell you. Oh, everything. Yeah, I'm just one house around the school, so I get it all. Yeah. Oh. I, I think uh, when I was talking earlier about the intense fragility of our lives, I think we feel that so acutely when we look at... Um, so... Like even how we're experiencing time, if it has a lightly or not lightly apocalyptic quality, which makes uh, environmentally um, peace on earth and goodwill to all men, fragility of our democracy and structures, we feel the erosion of it. And then I'm sure we feel, well, hey, I'm part way through, but what about you, lovies? So I think apocalyptic time is always a really difficult time to feel that generational transmission is because we have to tell a story of hope that is also true, but doesn't feel true at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I think one of the, I, I think one of the only comforting things is saying we actually have a lot of Christian language about different kinds of ways to love people in time, that apocalyptic time is a good, um, way of being honest about a future that feels unclear. But kids are also lovely in ordinary time. Snacks, bedtime, stuffies. Like, they're really good at teaching us how to move back and forth. And, and, they, are, and they are really lovely uh, also at the kind of interdependence that we are all basically relearning. So it is awful and so necessary what you're doing. And the tragedy you feel sounds like you are just seeing the world clearly and beautifully. So, well done you. More questions. Right there on the end. If Hi. I, I was greatly blessed upon graduating Duke University in 1979, walking out of the baccalaureate service in the chapel to be handed a blue leather-bound Duke Bible in which the first page uh, was the, the first bylaw of the university, which I wasn't aware of till then. It's, it essentially said that unto these ends always shall be the purposes of Duke University to equip graduates to live lives glorifying to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And my 
my question, which really maybe is for your deed and to take back to Duke is, in 2014, the trustees of Duke University redacted the name of Jesus Christ from the first bylaw of Duke University. And I feel a, a blessing has been stolen from me in that, and even for, for all graduates of Duke. So um, we should live lives glorifying to Christ. I, I would ask that the first bylaw of Duke University be restored. Thank you. What, what was the question in the form of a question? <laughs> I think it's okay. <laughs> Why was Jesus Christ redacted from the first bylaw of Duke University? Okay. I'm betting you weren't there when that happened. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right. Um, other questions for Kate? I have a bunch of them. Oh, there too. we are in the corner. Hey, yes. Ben. So much great wood paneling in this room, isn't there? <laughs> I should know by now. <laughs> Kate, I just want to thank you for your tears mm. and also the uh, woman who asked uh, the last question for her, her tears. And I've been brought to tears multiple times over hearing you speak. And I would just love to hear your own kind of reflections on the role of tears, the meaning behind tears, how you've seen that in your mm. own kind of journey. Uh -huh. Yeah. That is what a lovely, I have never thought of it that way. And uh, I, guess, I guess maybe, um, like when we get to the place beyond, because the word right is, I think it's consolation. Like that place right after language, where we're like right at the edge of what we know how to say. And the impossibility of it is like, we just look over the cliff and, um, And uh, when I, um, I promise this is a thing. Um, right after I got sick, uh, my colleagues got together to pray for me. And like not uh, sweet, luxurious, Trinitarian round out prayers. <laughs> like ugly, embarrassing, humiliating love. Like they begged God for me. And I saw people cry, I've never seen cry. And I can't tell you how much that has stayed with me uh, because I didn't cry nearly as, this much um, uh, because so many of the cultural scripts about um, progress and respectability were, I'm good on script. Um, but life off script meant uh, like a lot of uh, unwanted humility. And I think that's when I see someone with a great dignity of um, being embarrassed because uh, we love something and it feels impossible. I just feel very lucky. I'm, I feel lucky when I see it in someone else. I feel a little embarrassed when I see it in myself. So I'm not watching this video, Cherie. <laughs> um, I, I, will, I will, but I will respect all the work you put into it. <laughs> yeah. Right there on the corner. Hi. Hi there, how are you? Good. So, um, as an ordained minister, oh, okay. I have a question for you. And what kind are you, if you don't mind? Uh, what do you mean? What, what kind? kind of ordination? You are ordained into a tradition, I I'm imagine? ordained into the PCA. Your PCA, great. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I think one of the struggles for, for ministers mm -hmm. is doing what you're asking for mm -hmm. and what you're, you're rightly advocating from the pulpit mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Yeah because people don't want to keep coming back to a church mm. where they get the Psalms in their full reality <laughs> and they get Mary and Martha confronting Jesus saying, you know, if you'd have been here, yeah. this wouldn't have happened. Mm. And so what in, is, is you say, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of faith, you know, faith people and a lot of, um, you know, prosperity gospel people. So what, if you could, if you could sit into a room of pastors and say, here's what you should do on Sunday. Here's, here's how you should transform your regular messages. What would you say? Well, thankfully, that is uh, part of my job because they still make me teach. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I do teach pastors uh, on this uh, topic because I think you're right. It's, and uh, two, and not just canons and side canons, but there's, we're sort of dropping down weight on different parts of the story. And so Psalms are beautiful about this. Uh, Proverbs, very bossy. Extremely bossy. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, I think one, of the, one of the lovely things about seeing pastoral formation is you see, like they run the scales, right, theologically up and down, and they learn to tell all the stories, creation, eschatology, and in this one, I want them, I want a lovely minor chord in there that they know how to play in the right seasons. But also, um, Jesus will be born as a baby and not a king. And it will, uh, it will feel like an ember glowing. And there will be moments where there will be no tears necessary because we will feel so loved. So I just want them to learn to play all the scales. I'm just especially good at some of them. back there. Yep. Oh, hey, and it's up here. Um, I want to ask a question about this. What, what you talked about is this very American pursuit of trying. Hey, sorry, do you mind standing up so I can see your lovely oh, face? Yes. Uh, hey, sorry, uh, hi. hi. Um, and I think that there's sort of this, as you mentioned, this twisted way of, of trying to be younger, trying to be more prosperous, but I also know so many people who are trying so hard to make the world a better place. Yeah. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to acknowledging our own limitation in the face of so much need, you know, of poverty and homelessness and the climate crisis. Yeah. How do we acknowledge that we're not enough when we see so much that yeah. needs to be done? Yes, that's right. Like in pairing that language of limited agency with structural need, and also we have a thick structural language to account, we have language of injustice. We have commands to uh, love mercy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, and I think we see this fatigue, especially among our, our, our justice-seeking friends and hearts and those who attempt structural change. So uh, I think, this, I think the, 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 like the, the, the needle that's so difficult to thread right now is like not to fall back into hyperagency. You specifically will change the world, even though I actually kind of believe it about you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and acknowledging deep fatigue without then having um, such an inflated sense, uh, having like too great an apocalypse that we can't tell a story of hope. I, I, um, limited agency can be a gift, but we're, like, we're trying to calibrate our efforts with our resources at every moment. And that I think is like, um, I really like the language of prudence, which is such a wonderfully 19th century word. But it is, it is the wisdom to discern. And I think for that, I just feel I can see that I, I want so much for then all of us to have such a, an intense account of our own battery checks, where we can then, with humility, say, I can't. You will. We will. Let's go. Other questions for Kate? Uh, Quinn in the back there, if you could stand up. I like up. that you have a fireplace. <laughs> and I'm seeing all the parts of the room. <laughs> oh, he gets the microphone. It's a big day. <laughs> Sorry for another pastor's question. Oh, hi. Um, as you spoke, I, I just had in my mind um, the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah. And I'm curious what you would like to say about that book. What's your <laughs> history with the book? How do you read it now? Um, what do we do with it? Mm -hmm. As a Bible scholar, <laughs> I will say um, generally, because we all know, I don't like to veer outside of my lane. Uh, if you ask me a lot about American history, I will begin, it was the late 19th century. Mm. But I will say, because I'm messing around a lot more in scripture than I feel responsible for. Um, but the canon inside the canon, which is Ecclesiastes, uh, Psalms, skipping past parts of the Deuteronomic imperative because I'm not good at it. Um, an early tendered and scared church. I mean, there are easier parts of this to tell when, uh, when you're living in your own incompleteness. And you're trying, not to, and you're trying to borrow language of, um, of fear without hopelessness. So in those... In those scriptures, I, I, I then also like to balance it with the very small promises I think we do get. Surprising peace, confusing joy, uh, the ability to look at somebody else's pain and somehow know that it is beautiful. Isn't that odd? Mm -hmm. I mean, pastors, that's the reason you do it, is you go to the center of the universe with other people. You see their beginnings and ends, and then you feel somehow a part of 
the like substratum. So in all of that, um, I do like our small promises. I cherish our language of despair. But all of it is practice. Because as far as, I mean, I'm sure you can tell this about me. I would veer toward exhausting optimism if you left me on my own. I would star in a reality show about a woman who gets cancer, and she's pretty excited about it. <laughs> but, but scripture gives me a different language. Yeah. Take a few more questions right there. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this. I've been thinking all throughout this evening of just my own experience of professors mm. when I was a student and how inscrutable they were and how detached they were. Um, and you are so generous with your story and your life and your wisdom. And I'm just curious how you hold those identities together and what your generosity with your own story has maybe yeah. been able to unlock with your students. And also if you're seeing any shifts even like elsewhere in, in your school or in academia that sure. kind of yeah, brings out the, the personhood a little more. Aww. Well, that's, thank you for that compliment. That's so kind. Uh, I try to uh, respond by being a, like a cruel and Im Im impartial uh, grader. Uh, <laughs> each, each person more disappointing than the last. Um, <laughs> but you know, I did learn something. So I was reading a history of, uh, I love, you know, self-help, obviously, as you can tell. But um, it had an interesting comparison between the forms of academic learning that I've been trained inside, uh, that the goal was impartiality versus a certain kind of, and self-help uh, is predicated on a certain form of uh, second-person persuasiveness. And that uh, and one um, favors originality, and the other um, uh, copy-paste, copy-paste. And I thought that was such a helpful distinction for the kind of knowledge then that I, I got better at. I, I real, I've written some, written some good histories, um, but the, the problem was is when I was sick, they couldn't then say the true thing that I hadn't been trained into saying yet. And I, I do feel lucky because I did learn a lot about how to write a memoir from another colleague at the Divinity School, Lauren Winner, who wrote a lovely book, Mudhouse Sabbath and Girl Meets God. And so I, I've seen, I've seen beautiful examples in other people, but I think what it was training me out of was the idea that I could sort of keep my chips until the end. And then when, there, when the end was gonna come sooner, I was like, well, screw it. Mm. I hate this and this. <laughs> hey guys, I'm pretty, you know. Um, I hope it's made me uh, a better teacher because I think I'm clear about my own presuppositions than I was, but I, like, I know what's at stake, at least for me. Right there, you could stand up. Thank you for your books and your podcast. Um, always cry and laugh at everyone, and <laughs> appreciate how you help us to get to a place where sometimes we don't want to go, but it, you don't feel alone. Aww. My question would be: So when you're in a dark place and it's cloudy, yeah. yeah. How did you get to the point where you got to this point where you could write a book on blessings? Aww. Like, yeah. what process did you go through? How did you overcome the darkness so you can yeah. see the light? Yeah. And to be able to, and do you really believe it every time? Or are you yeah. just forced totally. to accept the blessings? Yeah, what a great um, question. Because I think all of us need to yeah. get to that point where we know they're there, but yeah. we just can't feel it. Yes. Or we don't want to be there because we want to feel the hurt. Mm -hmm. So what was your process to get to that? Because I think yeah. it took a while because yeah. we didn't get the blessings book first. We yeah, got yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah you got this first. super pit right. of garbage book right. first. <laughs> Yeah. But we're glad we got the blessings because eventually the truth came out <laughs> and the hope was there. Yeah. But we would all love to know yeah. what your process was so yeah. we could get there too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, lovey. Oh. That was a grab bag of compliments in there too, so thank you. Um, I, I guess it also depends like on when you're going through the horrible time, what is the emotion that's so difficult to acknowledge? Because for me, it was anger. Like, I was affronted. I, I, was, I was horrified. And I didn't have any, because we can't say deserve. So I was very stuck on that for a bit. For people who naturally turn to anger, it might be sadness that they can't access. So sometimes, I guess, what it took, the unsticking for me 
was about allowing myself a wider spectrum of spiritually true things to say about awful feelings. And like, not pious hope, just like unsentimental, no precious moments. So for me, it was anger. For other people, I think it's sadness. And also, I needed a bit to scrape away all the, aren't you just glad that? Because I could barely bring myself to acknowledge how, um, how I, think, I think honestly what it was was I didn't think I was going to get it. I, I, did, I was like, I think I'm going to die really politely. I don't think anyone's going to know. And then will I have said anything at all? Um, so uh, I found the kind of like um, Hulk style breaking out part was what I needed because uh, I feel the script. I, I'm from Mennonite world. We farm, we build furniture. You can't take us away from an unopened box of Ikea furniture. <laughs> but we are, ins we are insanely polite about our pain. So, and, and church was like that too. Uh, church ends at 12.05. Hope you weren't expecting a healing. That would take until 12.20. <laughs> so I needed a, a script breaking moment where I felt permission. And then I needed other people who had, who had learned how to keep because it's the keeping on, right? Mm -hmm. We can all do almost anything for a week. Can we do it for a year? Can we do it for, because despair is like at the edge, right? What if I can't do it, God? What if I can't do it, God? What if I can't do it? So just having a minute and seeing other people who just say, but even if you don't, mm -hmm. but even if you can't, I'll be right on the edge of that with you. That is what God's presence is to me, is like in the moment where I can't anymore, that lets me say, all right, all right, now we can. Now we can talk. <laughs> yeah. Because the rest is just performance, you know. We'll take one more question for Kate. Hey, sure. We have, I know we can't whisper because we have microphones. <laughs> can we read a blessing? Yes. Is that okay? Indeed. Okay. That's not suggested. I like how whispering works. <laughs> yeah. Hi. I saw a hand in the back there. Yeah. Yes, if you could stand. Hi, Kate. Hey. Um, when terrible things happen, I think there's a feeling of anger that it shouldn't be this way. Yeah. And where can that feeling still exist, even though you need to like move on, or yes. well, I actually need to keep living, even though something terrible has happened? Yes. So, yes. what do you do with that sense of just pure frustration that it shouldn't? It shouldn't this be this way. Shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't. Yeah. This is a design flaw. I've said this over and over again. <laughs> God, there are some design flaws. Honestly, I mean, I, I constantly, I'm like. Uh, sorry, why do we have to die? There are great, interesting theological answers. I still feel the horror of it. I think anger or confusion or rage, to me, is like saying something about the goodness of our creation. God, you love what you made. This is good, right? So I think in there, I don't I just honestly, I don't mind it. When someone is like, what in the actual? I'm like, that is a good, that is a good <laughs> theological place. So I think even if we're not always saying a good thing about the end, we can say a good thing about the beginning. God, you made this. Mm -hmm. Didn't you also kind of want something really lovely to happen? So, Kate, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank lovely. In just a second, I'd love for you to close us out by reading a blessing. Do you mind? That, uh, not in a weird at all. Way, in a weird... There's a few things to yeah. say beforehand, but that would be a great way to, to end. First of all, we just want to commend um, Kate's new book to all of you. There will be signed copies in the back for sale for $25. So hope that you will avail yourself of that. Also want to mention another invitation that should be available to all of you on your chair, which is to join the Trinity Forum Society, which is the community of people that make the mission of the forum, providing a space to wrestle with the big questions of life in the context of faith, like we've done tonight possible. In addition to being a wonderful community, and uh, promoting the mission of the Trinity Forum, there are a number of benefits involved, including a subscription to our quarterly readings. Uh, we have many readings in the back for sale as well. 
uh, a subscription to our daily list of what we're reading, curated reading recommendations. And as a special incentive for doing so, you will get your own free and signed copy of Kate's book tonight. So nice. avoid the line um, <laughs> and join the Trinity Forum Society. I uh, also just wanted to mention a couple of events coming up. Uh, many of you are familiar with our online conversations. Our next one will be on March 10th with Caitlin Beatty on her book, Celebrities for Jesus. Uh, we have a, a, a whole raft of online conversations coming, so be sure to check uh, your emails for that. And also wanted to mention not only our Trinity Forum readings for sale, but also the launch of our next book club box uh, to try to catalyze and encourage more reading groups across the country. So mm -hmm. if you are interested in that, uh, please grab one of us. We would love to talk to you more about becoming part of that movement. In fact, if the Trinity Forum staff could just stand up and wave their hand, um, that would be great, so you know who to go to for more information. Uh, as we wrap up, it's always appropriate to end with thanks, and there are many people uh, to thank who make an evening like this possible. I want to thank our partners in this effort, Duke Divinity School and Edgardo, along with his colleagues, uh, Betsy Poole, who is here, and Dan Struble, who is not. Uh, just thank you for the collaboration. It's been a really delightful partnership. Thank you to our sponsors who have helped make this evening possible. To the folks who make it all happen, Clay Blackmore, our excellent photographer who's around here somewhere. <laughs> uh, my Cracker Jack colleagues, Nikki Sheffield, our events coordinator, who today is her last day on the job. Aww. This is her swan song. Uh, our brand new colleague, Tom Walsh, our new uh, VP of Operations, his first day on the job, uh, along with Development Director Molly Wicker and uh, the Communications Director Brian Daskam, our excellent interns, Josh Alephant, Parker Coates, Sarah Mollick, volunteers, Lexi Marion, and intern Emeritus Ann Schurer. Thank you so much for all that you've done to make tonight possible. Again, Thank you, Kate, oh, for yeah. a wonderful conversation. And Guys, maybe you can you're close the, us out with a blessing. She is the very best, isn't she? She's just like kind and attentive and like tears in her eyes. And, do you mind if I use the podium? Oh, yeah. I'm gonna, um, so uh, I have the great blessing of my life is actually um, someone who openly fights me on every public act of speaking, which is why I didn't tell her. The Jessica Ritchie, will you come up and read this blessing? You're gonna be so mad. She has a terrible attitude and an incredible, she's a wonderful preacher and a beautiful writer and she is, uh, she's one of my very best friends in the world. So Jess, will you bless the crap out of this beautiful group um, with, uh, with this one, because I like it. Okay, I love you. Yep. For this ordinary day, Lord, here I am. How strange it is that some days feel like hurricanes and others like glassy seas and others like nothing much at all. Today is a cosmic shrug. My day planner says, rather conveniently, that I will not need you, cry for you, reach for you. Ordinarily, I might not think of you at all. Except, if you don't mind, let me notice you. Show up in the small necessities and everyday graces. God, be bread, be water, be laundry. Be the coffee cup in my hands and the reason to calm down in traffic. Be the gentler tone in my insistence today that people pick up after themselves for once. <laughs> be the reason I feel loved when I catch my own reflection or feel my own self-loathing fluttering in my stomach. Calm my spirit, lift my mind, make this dumb, ordinary day my prayer of thanks. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Kate. My pleasure. Let's do it again. Yes, let's do it again. Thank you to all of you for coming. Have a great night. Let's do it again. You're the best. Oh.